Thank you, Father, for blessing us this morning. Thank you for salvation that comes through your Son, Jesus, and His shed blood for us. Thank you that we can turn to you with our prayer needs. Father, we do pray for these whom we have mentioned. Uh, Father, you know the needs. You see the hearts of the families and you know the concerns. We lift them up to you. We lift up these who are on our prayer list this morning, Father. And may we be encouraged to pray frequently and often for these folks who are in special needs. And Father, look into our hearts as we gather together this morning. Uh, bless us that uh, you would re that you would lift up the burdens, that you would give us strength, that just by being together in worship this morning, that we would be able to to fellowship and uh, to know the love of God that is there for us. And now, Father, I pray that you'd bless us during the hour of worship. Be with the singing and the worship and the praise. Uh, be with the preacher as he shares your word. And be with each of us, Father, that we'll be lifted closer to the throne of grace just by being here with your people. Now bless us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Back in April, I had the final visit with my surgeon. And while I was in the hospital, uh, in the two weeks that I was in the hospital, I lost 20 pounds. Well, that's pretty good work. And I said to myself, I think I'm just going to keep that weight off. Obviously, I didn't. <laughs> when I went to see him the last time, he looked at my stomach and he said, uh, you need to understand how your body heals itself. And he said, whenever they open you up, they have a 70% chance that the, the tissue will only heal to 70% of the strength that it had before the surgery. And he looked at that incision and he said, Tom, I can almost guarantee you that at some point in time, I'm going to have a hernia. And I said, well, that's not a big problem. I said, that's just a little couple, three inch incision that they're going to make, isn't it? And he looked at me and he said, no. He said, we have to open the whole thing up and redo it again. So we're talking this long. And I thought to myself, maybe I better keep this weight off. But I didn't do it. And now I'm living with it and I'm very protective of my incision. And so when mowing season got here, uh, Lex, to protect me, decided that he would make me a backup mower instead of a regular mower. And he said, if they need a spare or someone can't do it, they'll call you. And I said, that's fine with me. Fortunately, I've gone through the whole summer without getting a phone call. But not to be outdone, I appointed myself a part of the mowing team and I am in charge of flowers, bushes, and weeds here at Linden Christian Church. And so a weed is really has a death wish if it's trying to grow around here. Because I've spent the summer spraying weeds, cutting down t weeds, uh, tearing out bushes, trimming bushes, planting flowers, watching them die, replanting them, watching them die, and trying it all over again. So when I came in the lot here a couple or three weeks ago, I always look at this fence as I'm coming in because the post office and I have spent last several years fighting the weeds growing up in that fence line over there. And I noticed that there was something growing on one of the trees over there. And so here is the first picture of what I saw growing on that tree. And I know what you're saying, that's poison ivy. And I'm smart enough to know that. And so I said, I can take care of that problem. And so I stopped the car. I took a picture of it because I saw this coming. And I'd got my handy dandy clippers out. And I got right down close to the ground. And I just snipped the stalk that it was growing out of. And I got back in my car and I left. Then when I came in the next morning, I thought, wonder what that looks like. And so I stopped the car and I looked, and this is the second picture. Notice the difference? And then a couple or three days later, I took another picture. Notice the difference? 
And then this week, earlier last week, I took another picture, and this is what it looks like now. I have won the battle with that poison ivy growing on that tree. Now, I know the poison ivy smarter than I am, and it'll come back somewhere else, and I'll have to do it all over again. But the point I want to make from this is that Jesus, throughout his ministry, oftentimes used everyday events and things to drive home specific points. And in John's gospel, in the 15th chapter, he talks about the fact that he is the vine and we are the branches. And he said, as long as you are attached to that vine, and he used the illustration of himself, he said, you're going to be able to produce fruits beyond belief. But he said, as soon as you detach yourself from that vine, this is what you're going to look like when it's all said and done. And so as we look at the book of Acts, we see in the second chapter, it said that the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in prayer, and meeting around the Lord's table. Amazing. 2,000 years ago, Luke realized what was really important to us as Christians, and that's the time that we spend together as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the point I want to make this morning is this. These four things that I told you about and mentioned just a moment ago are the four items that nourish us as Christians. And if we absent any of them from our spiritual development and spiritual growth, then we see what unfolded in this picture. The next day, the leaves had started to wilt. And then the next day, they were even worse. And before it's all said and done, what do we look like? We look like this dead vine back here. And so my encouragement from this this morning is to stay attached to the vine. And we do that through our time together around the Lord's table. You see, when I cut that stalk off, that took all the nourishment for the rest of the vine away. It didn't know what had happened. It just knew the nourishment was not there anymore, and it didn't really know how to react to it. And so it just withered and wilted and turned brown. Take this point home with you this morning. When we absent ourselves from the church, from the Lord's table, from prayer, from studying God's Word, from the fellowship that we have together as Christians, we are robbing ourselves of the nutrients that the Lord Jesus Christ produces in us and for us that we might grow as Christians. Don't let the world tell you that there are other things important or more important than our time together as a body of believers because we nourish ourselves through our time together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much that you have brought us together this morning and that you have brought us together around this table. And now we thank you very much for this aspect of our ministry and our Christian growth, our development, as we nourish ourselves in the blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for these beautiful emblems. Thank you so much for the refreshment that comes from them. And Father, we thank you so very, very much for your love for us and your patience with us. It's in your precious Son's name that we pray. Amen. The body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone's having a good Labor Day weekend so far. Hopefully you got some uh, big plans tomorrow grilling out or something. You got one, one last opportunity to jump in the pool or something. But uh, it'll be a good weekend. It's been a good weekend so far. Uh, both UofL, UK, both won. So 
Good weekend, right? Uh, hey, uh, let's go to God in prayer before we get started. God, thank you so much for today, and so much, uh, thank you so much for every single person here. Thank you so much for uh, how you've blessed them, how you've led them here today uh, to, to this church, uh, with this church family, uh, that we can come together as Christians and, and spur one another on to, to love and good works and, and praise your name for all the good things that you have done for us. We thank you so much for this, all the many blessings that you give us, and the greatest blessing of all, salvation through your Son. We thank you so much for loving us and dying on the cross for us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the world, standing at 29,031 feet. Reaching the summit of Mount Everest is on the bucket list of, of many adventure seekers around the world. There have been over 11,000 successful summits of Mount Everest, with 600 people reaching the summit just this year alone. But in mountain climbing circles, summoning Mount Everest is child's play compared to the second tallest mountain in the world. Uh, Mount Everest might be 1,000 feet higher but the mountain called K2 in the Karakoram mountain range of Pakistan is far more dangerous of a climb. Now because of the difficulty of the climb requiring a more technical climbing skill, uh, there have only been a little over 500 successful summits ever of K2. The most dangerous part of this climb up this mountain is a a portion called the bottleneck. Uh, the bottleneck is a, a very narrow gully. I think there's a, a picture of people climbing up the bottleneck, but the, the bottleneck is a very narrow gully that climbers must pass through in order to reach the final stage of the, of the climb to the summit. Uh, this, uh, this gully is lined uh, with a column of ice hanging overhead. It only takes a, a stiff gust of wind to knock Ice loose, causing an avalanche. The vast majority of deaths, which is about one death for every five summits, the vast majority of these deaths occur at the bottleneck. When climbers approach the bottleneck, they start on level ground. They plateau. But, but as they continue through the bottleneck, they begin to ascend. Now, the bottleneck is only about the length of a football field, about 100 yards, but it is at an incline, as you can see, of 80 degrees. Now, imagine standing at the base of the bottleneck, looking virtually straight up in the air. Here you're standing over 8,000 meters above sea level. Uh, the, this altitude, 8,000 meters above sea level, is called the death zone because the oxygen level is so low that you only have a very limited amount of time before the oxygen levels in your body drop below uh, the levels of survival. Uh, but, but, but at a moment's notice, a, a five-ton piece of ice could fall on your, uh, right on top of your head. Or, or just simply fall, causing an avalanche of snow and ice to come toppling over your head. The only thing keeping you from careening off the side of this mountain as you are ascending it at an 18 degree angle is just a thin piece of rope. Uh, imagine standing there on this plateau and asking yourself the question, should I turn back? Many people do turn back, especially when weather conditions are poor. But over 500 times, climbers have persevered and decided to continue the climb up to the summit. And they have successfully reached the top. Our spiritual walk is very similar to climbing a mountain. We start off with confidence. The weather at the bottom of the mountain is, is nice and comfortable. The weather is 
pleasant. The temperature is, is comfortable. The altitude doesn't bother us at the, the base of the mountain. But as we begin to ascend, we get more and more uncomfortable. God asks us to take steps of faith that maybe we aren't ready for. And we hit a plateau. We, we set up base camp and we get acclimatized to the altitude. But often, for many of us, instead of continuing up the mountain, we remain on the plateau where it's comfortable. We're used to the altitude. We're, we're used to the temperature. We're used to the weather conditions there on that plateau. It's safe on the plateau. And we decide not to continue with the mountain. Or worse yet, we decide to turn back altogether and go back to where we started. But God is calling you to take a next step, uh, to continue up the mountain where it will get uncomfortable, it will be difficult, but for those who press on, there's glory at the summit. We're in the final week of this sermon series. We've been calling Level Up. And we've been talking about leveling up your faith by taking a next step, by continuing to climb up the mountain, T taking one step after another. Uh, we talked about leveling up uh, your community by joining a small group. We've talked about, uh, you know, uh, leveling up uh, your, your time by volunteering to serve. We've talked about all kinds of different um, next steps that you could possibly take. M meeting a, a non-Christian friend and sharing your faith with him. Uh, but this, uh, this morning, or last week we talked about leveling up your generosity. This morning we, we want to talk about the next step that you have to take and what will help you get there. Well, when you plateau in your faith, when, when you get stuck in, in a spiritual rut... You feel like you aren't moving forward. You, you, you don't feel as connected to God. You, you, you feel like your, your prayer life is, is getting stale. You, you feel like you aren't learning or growing or, or being fed. You, you just kind of feel stuck. You, you started off great. You started off fired up and, and passionate. You, you, you looked up the mountain and you, you said, I, I got this. And you started to climb. But along the way, things got hard. It got difficult. Life happened. And it knocked you down. The altitude started taking your breath away. Then you hit a plateau. You set up base camp, and that's where you stayed. When we hit plateaus in our faith, in our spiritual walk... There's one thing that will help you push through that plateau. The, the number one reason that you feel like you can't push past that plateau in your faith is because you don't have the right people around you, supporting you, encouraging you to keep going, to take that next step in faith. Nobody makes it to the summit of an 8,000er alone. There are 14 mountains in the world that reach above 8,000 meters in the death zone. 14 mountains where the summit is, the oxygen level at the summit is, is too low for survival. Nobody reaches the summit of one of those mountains alone. Now there are, are Sherpas, mountain climbing guides, uh, who assist climbers up the mountain. That they give advice, they, they guide the way, they help you get up the mountain because they've been there before. Of the 600 or so people who climb, or summited Mount Everest this very year in 2023, 350 of them were Sherpas. More than half of the 600 people who summited the mountain had been there before. And they were there to assist the first timers who had never made it to the mountain before. There are other climbers that climb with you with varying degrees of experience. Uh, they, they, they come with you on this climb of the mountain, but nobody summits alone. 
in your faith journey, you cannot reach the summit by yourself. It would seem like mountain climbing is an individual sport, right? It's just you, the pack on your back, against the mountain. It's up to you to take one step after another to get to the top. But mountain climbers are only as good as the team around them. The the same is true for Christians. It seems as though being a Christian is an individual thing. It's an individual effort. It's between you and God. It's up to you to climb the mountain of faith. But Christians are only as good as the other Christians around them. It is vitally important to your faith to be surrounded by other Christians. The the author of Hebrews said it like this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, is no, long, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. We, we either hold fast to our confession, or we deliberately go on sinning. We, we either remain on the side of truth, or we go back to the side of lies. We are either on the side of Christ, or we are His adversary. We either continue in the faith, and we receive our reward when we reach the summit of the mountain, or we recant our faith and turn back, and are left with only an expectation of judgment and fire. Those are the, there are those in Christian denominations who teach that you are once saved, if you are once saved, you are always saved. But, but it is clear here in the book of Hebrews that there is a possibility that you can decide to leave your faith in Jesus behind. And you can return once again to an unsaved state. And the dividing line between remaining in the saved state by holding on to your faith, by continuing to believe in Jesus, and returning again to the unsaved state, state by giving up on your faith, by no longer believing in Jesus. The the watershed between these two options, the, the, the determining factor between which way you go is neglecting to meet together. The 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 difference between holding on to your faith or giving up on your faith is attending church on Sunday mornings. Uh, Throughout the course of American history, there there have been swings in the Christian faith. Just about every 50 years, the the, the first settlers who who came over from Europe were very pious uh, in their Christian faith. The the vast majority of settlers were either uh, fleeing religious persecution in Europe and then looking for, for religious freedom here in the New World, or they were missionaries driven to migrate to America to convert the indigenous people. They were, they were very pious people. However, in the 18th century, there was a plateau in religious fervor due largely to Enlightenment rationalism that led people away from Christianity and toward atheism and deism. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the trek across the Atlantic, the, the spaciousness of the new world created distance between people. Uh, even though the Enlightenment was based on Christian ideals, because people were separated from their Christian communities back in Europe, where their faith would have been strengthened, they were drawn away from the Christian aspects of the Enlightenment towards scientific atheism. But in the 1730s and 40s, uh, the first great awakening 
caused riot revivals to sweep across America. Uh, Christians uh, began gathering together to hear sermons by itinerant preachers, leading many to be reinvigorated in their Christian faith. Uh, many of the founding fathers were, uh, were influenced by the religious determination of their parents, who were in turn influenced by these, uh, this great awakening, these revivals that happened when, when Christians began to once again gather together. However, as the nation was in its infancy and westward expansion began in the early 19th century, uh, many people were drawn to the frontier. The frontier of America in the early part of the 1800s championed individualism. The, the, a family, they would move west, they would, uh, they would get land and build a homestead on, on acres and acres of land, distant from their neighbors. Uh, Christians were no longer with their Christian communities back east. The, the longer they were with their, um, uh, the, 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 the longer they were in the frontier, the less connected they were to other Christians. Uh, the, the homesteaders, they were looking for land uh, to sustain their families, attracted them to the frontier. But the frontier also attracted uh, ne'er-do-wells and scoundrels looking for freedom to engage in, in criminal activity and, and debauchery, an area with little or no law enforcement. And so this led, once again, to a general downturn in the Christian faith. But a second great awakening took place as, once again, people began meeting together in camp meetings. Uh, one, one of those camp meetings at Cane Ridge uh, sparked the Restoration Movement where this church draws its heritage. The, the revivals uh, that, that once again swept the country were sparked by people once again meeting together. However, in the, the middle part of the 19th century, the Civil War created an existential crisis that caused many people to give up their faith. And many churches through the South were, were burned down. People were, were relocated from their homes and from their Christian communities. That many people were drawn away from Christianity to, and during this time towards spiritualism and the occult. Mary Todd Lincoln actually held seances in the White House. But because of the influence of traveling evangelists like uh, Dwight Moody and Billy Sunday and Mordecai Ham, who I mentioned a couple weeks ago, they, they held big tent revivals where Christians once again started gathering together. And many people reclaimed their Christian faith. In the early 20th century, faith in Christ uh, began to wane once again. After the war to end all wars led many people to question the existence of God in the midst of previously unspeakable carnage. Uh, likewise, the, the, the previously unknown horrors of World War II and the Holocaust caused many people to leave their faith behind. But the threat of an atheist empire caused many people to once again gather together and rely on one another and recreate those Christian communities once again. People gathered together in small towns all across this nation and they went to church on Sundays. Everything else in town was closed because people were in church on Sundays. Uh, just as the, the, the Soviet, uh, Soviet threat, or just as, as, as Soviet was synonymous with atheist, American became synonymous with Christian. But, but just as the, the fall of the Soviet Union took place, that coincided with the rise of a new threat, threat to our Christian values, Muslim terrorists. The attack on 9-11 once again coalesced our communities and we were galvanized by our faith in Christ because we came together. But over the last 20 years, we have seen a decline in Christian faith because people have slowly stopped meeting together. Many people have prioritized things like traveling sports teams over church. 
Many churches have watered down the doctrine in an effort to attract seekers. Scandals in the church have turned people off. Cultural shifts in opinions on same-sex marriage and abortion have caused many people to believe the church is behind the times. But because of these reasons, church attendance has been declining through the 21st century. But then the COVID pandemic hit and church attendance plummeted. 20% of people who attend church are attending church less than they did just three years ago before the pandemic. About 60% of people who attend church now in 2023 opt to watch church online instead of attending in person at least once a month. 20% of them choose to exclusively watch church online. Every single downturn in religious faith in America over the past 300 years has been a direct result of people neglecting to meet together. And we're in the midst of a period where more and more people are opting out of attending church. All throughout this sermon series, we've been talking about how in God's kingdom, less is more. But this is one instance where more is more. The more you attend church, the stronger your faith will be. Because you'll be around people who will spur you on to love and good works. They'll encourage you to keep climbing the mountain. The the less you attend church, the more likely you will turn back and give up on your faith. And the only thing that's back the other way is a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that consumes God's adversaries. When we are at a plateau in our faith, we need the church to help us through. When we're standing at the base of the climb, looking straight up at the summit, and all we can see are huge towers of glacial ice looming over our heads. And every fiber of our being tells us to turn back. It is God's people who take us by the hand and they say, let's go up. Let's move forward. Let's take the next step. At chapter 12, the author of Hebrews tells us exactly what it takes to push through plateaus in our faith. Uh, The chapter 11, the the chapter right before uh, chapter 12 uh, in the book of Hebrews is called the faith chapter. Because it lists out person after person who pushed through plateaus and did extraordinary things in faith. People like Abraham and Moses and Samson and David. Famous patriarchs of the faith. But also ordinary, everyday people like you and me. This is the description of their faith. These people who through faith conquered kingdoms, Enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, uh, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were, saw, they were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. The, these people, they came to the bottleneck where pain... Suffering, the threat of death caused them to question whether they wanted to continue on. And they pushed through. And they continued to climb. All of these great warriors of faith pushed through plateaus. And then the author of Hebrews told us how we could do the same. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. Let's read that together. Therefore... 
Because of all these great people of faith, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with the endurance, with endurance, the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. There are three things that the author of Hebrews tells us will help you push through plateaus in your faith. When you you get stuck in a spiritual rut, these three things will get you out of it. And in all three of them, you need other Christians surrounding you, spurring you on to do them. You cannot do them alone. You cannot do them in isolation. You will fail every single time. But, If you are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, you will be spurred on to keep climbing. The cloud of witnesses, that's the Greek word martyrs. The the cloud of witnesses are all the other Christians who have summited the mountain before you. And all the people who are currently climbing the mountain right now. All, All these mighty warriors of faith who were martyred and persecuted for their faith. All these people who went before you and they reached the summit in the face of certain death. Because we have all these witnesses, these martyrs, who have pushed through and patiently endured the suffering, we can do it too. And and this is how. The first thing that, that helps us to reach the mountain is to throw off the sin that entangles you. Paul used the metaphor of running a race. In ancient Greek games, the athletes, uh, the runners, they, they race naked. Because carrying excess weight and, um, uh, uh, would encumber them. The, the, their tunics would get tangled up in their legs. The, it, it would trip them up. It would create air resistance to make them run slower. So for all these reasons, they would throw off their tunics and race naked. And Paul is saying, your sin encumbers you in the same way. Throw off your sin because it hinders your progress up the mountain. When you are surrounded by other Christians who are throwing off their sin, you are encouraged to throw off your sin also. However, when you're around other people who are encumbered by sin, you're more likely to be encumbered by sin as well. The first reason that regular church attendance is vital to your Christian faith is because it helps you to throw off your sin that entangles you. It helps you to rid sin from your life. And having other Christians around you helps you to do that. But but, but just coming to church and sitting in a pew for an hour, it'll only get you so far. You need the other people sitting in the pews to help you. You need the accountability of a close friend. 70% of people say they do not have a close friend at church. Some of you attend here every single week, and you don't even know the people of the names of the people who sit in the pew in front of you. Maybe you do know the people who sit in the pew next to you, but you don't know the people who sit, the names of the people who sit on the other side of 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 the church. But one thing that might help you find a close friend here in this church, and I know this is going to be hard for some of you, sit in a different pew. Sit on the other side of the, the church. Go sit by someone you don't know their name and get to know them. And you'll get to know more people. And maybe you will be able to find a close friend who will hold you accountable to throwing off your sin. 
that might be a next step for you. Now, the second thing that helps us to push through plateaus is to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the preeminent example of living a life of faith. Look to his example of how to live. He endured the cross. Why did he do that? Because of the joy that it would lead to. Why do we push through plateaus? Because of the joy that's on the other side. The joy for him was living eternally with all his people in heaven. That's why he endured the cross. The idea that you and I would live with him forever in heaven brought him joy. And that is why he endured the cross. When you look to Christ as your example of patient endurance and you set your eyes on the end result, you look past the bottleneck to the summit. You set your mind on heaven and you look past the suffering that you have to endure to get there. When you set your mind on heaven, what you are enduring becomes temporary. It's short-lived. But the reward is permanent. You can choose to turn back, but you will miss out, or you can choose to, to turn back and miss out on this temporary suffering, but you will lose out on the permanent reward. Consider him who endured hostility so that you won't grow weary or faint-hearted. But it's easy to lose sight of Jesus, especially when you don't attend church regularly, where every single week you'll be reminded of him and his endurance. So your next step might be to attend one more week than you already are. If you are attending church once a month, generally throughout the year, Maybe your next step is to make it a point to attend twice a month. If, you're, if you generally attend church twice a month, maybe your next step is to say, hey, I'm going to make sure I'm there three times a month. I know things happen and, and things come up and you have to miss sometimes, but make it a, a point to be here at church on Sunday because it is vitally important to your faith. Attend one more week than you are currently attending. And third, remember that you have not yet suffered to the point of shedding your own blood. No matter what you're facing, no matter what pain or suffering lay before you, you haven't yet shed your own blood. What you are going through is not comparable to what other people have gone through and endured. Anytime I want to complain about something in my life, I tell myself, I'm not being crucified on the cross. I can get through this. It's going to be okay. You may be suffering, but your suffering isn't comparable to those who have gone before you. It isn't comparable to the people who are persecuted around the world. Don't waller in self-pity. Remember, you have yet to shed your own blood. Remember the valor of those who have. You can continue to endure because you still got a heartbeat. In order to push through those plateaus in your faith, you, you need only to look at the cloud of witnesses who surround you. The, those warriors of faith who decided to continue to climb. They looked in the face of certain death and they walked forward. They didn't shrink back. They didn't cower. We, we have a cloud of witnesses here at Linden Christian Church who have endured great things. Our next Sunday, we're going to gather together for our next mental health workshop. And one of those witnesses is going to share her story. Linda Carter, she's going to share her struggle with mental health and how she has endured. Uh, attending that 
mental health workshop might be the next step for you. It'll help you, remind you, it'll help to remind you that you have not yet endured what others have endured. And so you can keep going. Here at LCC, we're going to walk hand in hand, up the mountain together, through the bottleneck together to the summit. No matter how difficult, no, no matter how intimidating, no matter what lay before us, we're going to climb, and we're going to do it together. Throw off the sin that entangles, look to Jesus, and remember that you have yet to shed your own blood. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the example of patient endurance. When, when you came into this world to die on the cross for us. There, there are so many people here who are patiently enduring through suffering in life. And I don't know what it is that they're going through, but I pray that they would be inspired and spurred on to keep going. Because of your example. Because we are standing here climbing with them. Help us to be people who grab one another's hand and say, we're going to climb together. And we're going to reach the summit together. We're not going to turn back. We're not going to give up. We're going to continue to have faith. We're going to continue to believe that your promises are true. No matter what happens in our life, no matter how much pain, no matter how much suffering, no matter what life throws at us, we're going to continue to climb. Help us to never give up. Strengthen us every single day in our faith. And help us to be strengthened together as a church. We love you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who empowers us to keep going. And thank you so much for the inspiration of the life of Christ that showed us how to keep going. It's in your name I pray. Amen.